morning, everybody. Yeah, I, I heard that you had a challenging uh, night yesterday, and uh, the attendance level and the power law distribution of students slowly filtering in um, testifies to that. So thanks for, for coming. <laughs> um, uh, so what I would like to uh, do in uh, this lecture is uh, switch gears in a way, and I uh, would like to discuss the interplay of um, two types of topological, um, of insulating materials, uh, topological insulators, our friends here, and another type of insulator, the Anderson insulator. And uh, to anticipate a little, um, the punchline I want to drive it is that in a regime where the insulating behavior of both classes is strongly established, um, the ensuing physics will be extremely simple. Um, pristine physics, um, uh, we will see that uh, edge transport um, in the topological regime um, becomes really clearly exposed. And um, what's also interesting is that the passage towards this strongly localizing regime, I mean, its description is very, very simple. It can be described by the, in, a, in a stat Mac spirit by the scaling flow of uh, two variables, which I will introduce. So um, we need to keep track of only two variables. And um, uh, the origin of this simplicity is in a way that due to the presence of disorder, we have in a way averaged out over all degrees of freedom that are not central to topology and slash symmetry. So all what's non-universal is gone. And in a statistical sense, you have arrived at something simple. And the construction of that picture, of that way of thinking, uh, will not require a single formula. So we can just, just get to these conclusions by co common sense reasoning. And that I want to introduce. And then in the second part of the talk, which is optional, um, I tell you that sometimes we actually do like to calculate a few things uh, in quantitative ways. And um, we will get to that as well, perhaps. OK, so um, the um, somehow. I have a problem with my remote. Ah, oh, no. So um, the, 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 the way to get into this, um, I introduce first our two class of, um, of, of, of materials. And um, the first is topological, which I don't have to introduce now anymore. Um, I just want to mention that there will be a Gini pick, um, which we will use as a recurrent example. And that's our old friend, the Zuschriefer uh, Heger chain, clean. Yeah? So, so far, we are on the clean topological level. Um, and um, Right now, we don't have to discuss it in any more detail. The, um, our old friend, the uh, chain of um, uh, one dimensional chain of sites are connected by uh, a staggered system of hopping amplitudes. And then we have, in general, a gapped phase. But there is a um, phase transition point in the middle. And uh, in one regime, we have edge states. And we can um, probe this edge state formation by tuning the control parameter, which sends you through a topological phase transition on the right. And you see the disappearance of edge states on the left. And one can actually calculate this analytically. Um, and finally, uh, what we've also seen is that to understand the topological nature of the system, you have to take a look at the Hamiltonian. Um, and you can look at it in the Bloch representation, in which case um, its matrix element become functions of a Bloch momentum, complex valued functions. And then you distinguish between two cases, namely whether these um, matrix elements in the complex plane as a function of the block momentum describe a curve encircling the origin or not. That is winding number plus one or zero. And one regime is topological and the other one is not. Yes? Huh? Oh. Aha. Uh -huh. Now I feel detached. But um, anyway, good. Um, so that's, uh, we, we, we had all this. Um, I will use this paradigm later to introduce disorder. So we will disorder the zuschriefer heger chain and ask what happens then. Yeah? But before that, we introduce the non-topological Anderson insulator. So forget the topology. And um, quite a bit of I mean, important uh, messages has already been communicated by Jens in his talk. Let me add a little bit. Um, so underlying the phenomenon of Anderson localization is a phenomenon that if you take a um, Schrödinger operator, and introduce some kind of disorder. The eigen solutions are generally um, often generically exponentially decaying. But um, the way in which this happens, in, in a crucial way, depends on dimension. And that was already introduced by Jens. Um, the story is that in low dimensions, one and two, you need only um, an arbitrarily weak amount of disorder, of stochasticity in your Schrodinger 
um, equation will suffice to eventually localize eigenstates. In three dimensions, the situation is a little different. Um, here you need strong disorder, strong in the sense that the characteristic energy scales introduced by disorder have to be of the same order as um, the energy of the carriers you're interested in to actually affect Anderson localization. Um, if the disorder is weaker, you have extended state. Yeah? So there is a crucial um, importance of dimensionality. Now, one question is how do we uh, communicate the essence of the effect in, in a, I mean, I give you a piece of metal or, or, or maybe insulator and I ask the question, how can I describe the essential universal ramifications of Anderson localization in, in, in simple terms and the answer is a scaling approach. Scaling approach turns out to be very um, productive and um, fruitful in this context and what do I mean by that? If you want to have a system and you want to know if it's localizing or not, the best thing to do is measure a transport coefficient, say conductance. Yeah? So you measure the conductance and you get a number, but that number will depend on the extension of your system, naturally. And now you do a Gedanken experiment, um, or you can do effectively the same experiments um, uh, in, in real life, but for us, let's do a Gedanken experiment. We just change the size and ask, how does this conductance G of L, how does it flow? Yeah? And it's sort of evident that if it, you have um, conducting behavior, you get something like maybe algebraic behavior, Ohm's law. Um, but if you have localization, you will expect exponential decay. Clear, right? And um, this, I mean, is a very simple um, line of reasoning. And it was, uh, in a way, made semi-quantitative and um, established in, in more um, uh, I mean, substantial ways in the famous paper by the Gang of Four, which was already mentioned by uh, Jens. And the upshot was um, the scaling diagram he discussed. Remember the scaling diagram? We had it, have it seen before. So you see here three lines which describe essentially how the conductance changes under variations of L. That's on the ordinate. Never mind that they are logarithmic scales. Yeah, that's not essential. And how it um, changes uh, in dependence of a starting value of G, which is on the abscissa. And G is our starting conductance. And you see that, um, Jens discussed it in, in, in low dimensions, one and two, um, you always, this is three, but um, I mean, let's first focus on the other two curves. I mean, for uh, one and two dimensions, you always have a decay of the conductance. You flow from initially slowly, but then exponentially fast into a localizing regime. In three dimensions, you have the famous Anderson transition point, which discriminates between a metallic phase, large conductance, from an insulating phase, of small conductance, independence of the starting value, which in turn depends on the initial value of the disorder. Yeah? That, and that's essentially all you need to know about the essence of, well, that, that, that's, that's good to know this. So let's recall um, that um, the essential physics of Anderson localization is encoded in the scaling of a single scaling variable G of L. Yeah, that will be essential. And now we uh, are in a position to ask what happens if we bring these two concepts together, topological insulating material and Anderson insulating. And we can ask different types of questions. One is, um, say, start from a clean topological band insulator. What happens as you did at this order? And this order is always present. So um, will it eventually flow into an Anderson insulator? And how does this Anderson insulator differ from a conventional one, that, one that builds on an ordinary metal? Conversely, I mean, you can ask the same question in reverse. Um, how what is the physics of Anderson insulators building on some topological base, clean base, yeah? And um, uh, we will observe that the answer to these questions leads to the emergence of an animal that sits in the middle, the topological Anderson insulator, which differs in its physics both from the clean, Anderson, uh, clean topological and non-topological Anderson insulator. And it has, um, I think, interesting physical properties, which I want to discuss. Okay? Um, now... Yeah, um, um, the outline or the organization of what follows is I will first, in the a, in a first part, discuss entirely on qualitative grounds, as promised. I will discuss the interplay of disorder and topology. Um, that will, in a natural way, lead to the emergence of some kind of um, stat -mac, quantum stat -mac picture um, and to uh, quantum critical phenomena. And um, I will then briefly describe how these uh, phenomena can be captured by that Mac methods, which means that there is some field theory underlying. And if time permits, I will say a few words on the emergent physics at the edge, where actually life is happening yeah, in a topological insulator. 
And if you're interested down there in the corner, I mean, you can have, I will distribute these slides. There yeah, are a few references where um, um, this can be found, this material, in a detailed exposition. So um, let me begin with an important case study, um, namely um, the physics of the um, integer quantum Hall effect, historically the second um, uh, insulator that was topological insulator emerged. So in the, in the mid-70s, we had SSH. But then in the beginning of the 80s uh, came quantum Hall, and that's still the most important topological insulator, I would say. And what makes it even more important for my story is that in the context of the integer quantum Hall, the key importance of disorder was realized right from the beginning. Yeah? So, I mean, months after the discovery of the quantum Hall effect, uh, people were talking about disorder quite a lot. And let me explain why. So this is a um, quantum Hall uh, story. So you have a pictorially um, some real space coordinate, and above it, a Landau level spectrum. The um, levels need not be equally spaced. I mean, in Dirac materials, you will have a non-uniform spacing. What is important is that you have a macroscopic um, classical separation between them, um, and they are massively degenerate, massively degenerate. So in each of these levels, you have lots and lots of states, yeah? which means that the density of states is uh, highly, highly singular. Yeah? You, in general, you have no states, but every once in a while, you have a shoot-up microscopic amount. So very singular density of states. If you introduce edges, I mean, that was also brought up by Jens, um, the levels bent up, the band structures went up at the, at the edge, and um, they cross wherever the Fermi surface is, they will cross, and you get um, an integer number of edge modes, depending on the number of levels below um, the Fermi edge. Okay, that's simply enough. Now let's take a look at the measured data at the time. Uh, and there were two, essentially two observables where uh, in the focus of interest, the longitudinal conductance, ordinary electric conductance, which you see as a curve there, this wiggly guy on the bottom, which is usually close to zero, means generically you have vanishing conductance. That makes sense. We have an insulator. And every once in a while it shoots up. Uh, that happens when the Fermi level crosses one of these Landau bands. Yeah? As a function of, a, there's a control parameter B, you can use it to effectively control the Fermi energy, and every once in a while you cross, and um, you have a metallic intermittent uh, phase. And then you have its twin partner, the uh, transverse hall conductance, which does this famous step function stuff, yeah? and um, which is a generically quantized quantum hall effect. L let me already announce from a modern perspective, <coughs> we look at, we'd look at this um, sigma xy, the step function beast, as a topological index, um, as I will explain in a second, averaged over disorder. Yeah? But that's what it is. I mean, there's topology. Um, now, the thing is that this experimental curve, if you look at it, is smooth. I mean, you see that there's actually some smoothish transitions, and this smoothness is not a result of an er error or something like that. It's, it's physics. Yeah? So it's intrinsically smooth. Um, and the degree of smoothness depends on temperature, system size, and all kinds of things, but it is smooth. And there is no way you get such a smooth curve from this density of states. That's evident, yeah? It will be, I mean, if you, if you, you can work it out, but it will be a crazy curve you would get from such a density of states profile. So there has to be something um, that explains the smoothness, and that is disorder. So um, people observe that in, in a, a typical quantum Hall sample is, is never clean. There are impurity states um, in the middle which don't care about the position of the Landau levels. And that means that on average, if you average over configurations, um, the density of states is actually smooth as well. So the red curve down there, and what's very important um, punchline or important message I want to convey, there is no gap in the system. Yeah? The system is, has, doesn't have any kind of spectral gap. So often we hear a topological insulator XY is stable as long as you have a spectral gap in the spectrum, but in reality that's nonsense. There is never spectral gaps, never ever. Even for weak disorder, you always have tail states so we, we, we ought to explain topology without the notion reference to gaps eventually. Yeah? Okay, so um, that was that. Now, <coughs> let's ask, um, and that is now an essential argument, so I really want to follow here. Yeah? Let's ask how we can make this a little more substantial, this, this picture. Yeah? And um, the um, upshot is, I mean, a scaling diagram, a two-parameter scaling diagram of two variables that was introduced in the very early 80s by Kmelnitsky and uh, Pruskin, and uh, it does the following. Remember, we, before we had the statement that an ordinary Anderson insulator is described by a single scaling variable, and 
then I mean that was time where scaling where these scaling pictures were all in the air and it was very natural to ask whether there is an extended scaling approach that now describes the quantum Hall effect as well and the answer was affirmative um, the, the story is that um, instead of a single scaling variable you need not, you need two and one of these is uh, the conductance. We are in two dimensions. Conductance and conductivity is the same. So sigma xx conductance is, remains an essential scaling variable. But now we add to it sigma xy, the transverse conductance. And uh, we can ask ourselves the question, um, how will these two in combination now scale if we make a Duncan experiment and make a system bigger and bigger? Exponentially small, and in the, in the thermodynamic limit, it will be exactly zero. That's what I'm going to. It's, it's literally the next sentence. <laughs> uh, right, because here's what happens. It was already. Uh, um, so suppose we take. Imagine you have a finite size sip, sample. Yeah, I mean some. I don't know half a micron. You measure um, sigma xx, sigma xy, in, um, in, in a, and then you average maybe over a few configurations. You get two numbers. And these numbers, uh, sigma xx will be some finite value, and sigma xy will be another finite value. And importantly, this nobody, this sigma xy will not be quantized. 1.7. Now, um, <clears throat> so 1.7, we would be here, yeah. And now we ask ourselves, what happens if we make the system bigger and bigger, and we want to be compatible with the experimental data? And um, the answer is that um, uh, the sigma xy will flow in the sense of a scaling to an integer value and to the nearest integer value there is, in which it would be 2.0 in the thermodynamic limit. It's, it's consistency argument, yeah, there's no proof here. And at the same time, um, sigma xx will go to zero. So it will rush sigma xx. So you, you end up, the terminal points, the fixed points are these um, integer spaced points here on the sigma xx zero uh, line, yeah? And um, what you, there is one exception to this generic scaling um, behavior, and that is when you start, um, oh gosh, ah, yeah, here. When you start, uh, say, right in the middle between, I mean, initially you were very, very close, maybe mathematically close to um, a half integer value, and then the system just cannot decide. It, so sigma xy um, is predicted to stay what it is. This is a fixed line. And sigma xx will end up at some finite value, which experimentally, turns out to be non-universal, um, non the, the height of these spikes, but being serious, we believe that if everything was totally right and pristine, it would be the same value, only we don't know this value. The critical value is still, I mean, the, the critical physics of the quantum Hall transition, which is here blown up, um, happens at values of sigma xx which are small. Um, so order uni unity and our theoretical toolboxes are just not rich enough. There must be some conformal field theory describing this regime, but we just don't know it yet. But by and large, that's the physics. Two scaling variables, and um, they, they, they describe what's going on. Now, there is a slight challenge. Um, ever since, this was the first time this diagram was plotted, ever since it has been plotted by 90 degrees rotated. So we'll see it lots of times again, but please, in your head, Always turn it 90, do it now, turn 90 degree upside down. Yeah? That's the way you will see it, see it usually represented in the literature. Is that clear up to this point? Scaling picture, two variables, finite size scaling, and that's pretty much the essence of it. Yeah? And, and I will now um, 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 elaborate on that and um, put this into um, the context of modern to, um, topological metaphysics. So let me proceed in a a slightly historizing way. Um, so disorder topology, what happened next? Not much in the late 80s, as far as we are here concerned. Then uh, mid 90s, this uh, concept of symmetry classes came up, which we have already described. There are unitary symmetries and there are anti-unitary guys labeled by these um, uh, labels. And um, that was just an observation at the time. Not much was happening in that regard. But there was an interesting interlude at the end of the 90s, early 2000s, before the topological insulators came up. At that time, uh, people began to play with one and two dimensional wires. I mean, quantum, quantum wires um, belonging to the novel symmetry classes. I mean, disordered superconductors, disordered chiral metals, stuff like that. And the observation was, I mean, there were quite, quite, a, quite a number of papers, um, that 
in various of these species, funny delocalization phenomena were observed. Delocalization in 1D and 2D where it doesn't belong. Yeah, we just argued localization is pervasive in one and two dimensions. And so there was delocalization going on, and what, what's more, um, this delocalization physics was strangely non-universal. I mean, there were, there were even some fights in the literature. So some system you had to, depending on the number of channels or depending on the type of disorder, you had delocalization. In other cases, you didn't. What happened there, without people understanding, except for one person, Nick Reed, he understood this already to quite some extent, was that there was topology involved. And these delocalization points were actually topological insulator quantum wires uh, fine-tuned to a topological phase transition point. So by accident, people tuned into one of these phase transition points of a topological insulator, disordered, observed um, the ensuing critical physics and not understanding what they did. Yeah, this, um, was. I mean, it happened frequently at that time. Then, um, uh, 2006-ish, um, modern topological matter appears, the, the, um, topological band insulators, uh, we are hearing about this here. Um, the periodic table came up um, slightly later, um, classifying different regimes, and um, you know that by now, um, various of these um, have been observed in real life or in silico. Um, and nobody talked about disorder anymore. But uh, then slightly later, 2010-ish, uh, um, the term topological, I mean, disorder came up again. <laughs> the term uh, topological insulator was coined, but um, as I want to argue, conceptually, that gets us back to quantum hole physics, essentially. Uh, there is not, not much uh, on the conceptual level that's appearing, um, has appeared on the surface. So against this background, um, let's now um, really discuss um, in, in a little more microscopic ways, but totally qualitative, uh, what disorder and topology, I mean, how they will talk to each other. And um, there are a few observations. Uh, one is um, we all love uh, to describe topology in terms of some classifying maps from prion zones to um, God knows what. And um, that doesn't work anymore in the presence of even moderate disorder because there is no translational invariance and hence no prion zone. No? So that's one thing maybe methodological point. Then comes the physical point. I already mentioned it, that um, this order um, kills band gaps. So no, no, no gaps allowed in the uh, theoretical approach. And here's um, slightly more, uh, not subtle, but um, more substantial point. Let's talk about topological indices. And the story here is that if you take a given realization of some disordered um, um, substance building on, I mean, disorder added to a topological insulator, and you measure the index, uh, maybe on a computer, you will always find an integer. Uh, topology is robust. You add a bit of disorder, there will be some index. But um, if you take a different configuration of disorder, the index may change. Nobody permits it from doing that. And if you started from a situation where you were initially close to a phase transition point, where the band gap is already close-ish, uh, small-ish, then um, the system will find it um, harder and harder to actually make up its mind, and it will often switch from one situation to the other, depending on the disorder you add. Yeah? Which is to say that the topological index becomes an integer valued uh, distributed variable. And um, the mean of these variables need not be integer. It can be something. And it is something in, in general, so some value. And um, I will denote this in, I mean, configurational average of topological indices, I will denote it in the following by the label chi. And chi can be some number, and then we ask um, what happens if we scale. If you make the system bigger and bigger, I mean, what will, this is this kind of scaling um, approach, yeah, which um, here, in a way, introduced again. And the overall conclusion of this so far is that um, we can draw a little table, clean versus disordered, what's going on. And so we have clean case, we have band theory. Um, in the disordered case, we don't. There are gaps, in the disorder case they go, and the index has a somewhat ambiguous status, or a generalized status. No? Okay, that we can say. Now, um, uh, we can try to make this more predictive and um, ask what will really be going on. And again, on a qualitative level, and um, I'm, I'm telling you an argument which, uh, interestingly, is 2001. I mean, was introduced in 2001, again, pre-topological insulator times by David Hughes and um, collaborators. And uh, the starting point is as follows. Consider some band insulator. 
what your favorite topological insulator, yeah? And let's assume that this guy um, has, um, is under the influence of some control parameter, magnetic field, chemical potential, whatever, which uh, lets you tune through phase transition points um, into bassins of different topological index. Yeah? Say in the bottom you have index, um, uh, down there here is ordinary insulator, then you jump to index one, two, and one, and back zero. Typical situation. Yeah? And now um, we introduce an, uh, in a Gedanken experiment another axis which is meant to represent disorder strength. Now we add disorder to the situation and we ask what is going to happen. And that will be the essential diagram of the whole talk now. Um, so, yeah, and here it is. I mean, Motronich Damles used and um, resurfaced again in uh, 2010, this argument. Um, the, what, what is generically going to happen is the following. So, suppose you start here well into it in a topological phase. You have a well established band gap in the clean case. Now you add disorder, not, not so much happens for very weak disorder, but eventually the disorder will be strong enough to fill up the band gap. It will be, you will have sizable impurity states everywhere. And what then happens is that there is a crossover, not a phase transition, a crossover from a band insulator into an Anderson insulator in low dimensions. Yeah, here we are, have strong disorder, low dimensions, Anderson insulator. No? And there is no phase transition. Now, um, on the other hand, we have topological phase transition points sitting here and here and here. And at these points, the band gap closes, clean band gap, which means that the amount of disorder you need to induce this crossover will go to zero. Yeah, if there is no gap, there is nothing to fill up. And so you have this kind of wobbly curve, crossover uh, curve. But there are still our phase transition points sitting on the ordinate, on the, on the points on the left. And um, the argument now goes that um, the phase transition point will not be compromised by cross crossover. So the phase transition points, there must be still phase transitions. Um, but now we have an, uh, <coughs> an additional parameter. And um, the, the conclusion is that these phase transition points become phase transition lines or end points of phase transition lines. And these phase transition lines meander deep into this disordered realm somewhere. So if you accept that, it's not math, yeah, it's a prediction, then the conclusion is that here, deep in the Anderson insulating phase, where there is nothing, no band gaps, no nothing, uh, there is still phase transitions. And they are in the, pretty much in the same universality class, so topological phase transitions. Meaning that, say, if you sit here, you can increase the amount of disorder and hit a phase transition line. Yeah, purely in an Anderson. So and that, that universe out there, that's the topological Anderson insulator. It's the Anderson insulator penetrated by topological phase transition lines in some way. Okay, so what happened in these 90, uh, 90, late 90s papers, early 2000s, was that uh, we were out there in the disordered regime and played with some parameters and accidentally hit one of these lines. And then, oops, you have delocalization. Why is that? Because it's a second order phase transition. All length scales diverge, including the localization length. So uh, delocalization is inescapable. And um, uh, since then, um, in later, <coughs> People have been doing different things like um, taking whatever, Majorana wire and, and, and adding disorder and then observing that, oops, you, uh, if you increase the amount of disorder, you, you, you hit these phase transition points. So, so you can go through these points um, however you want. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, right. Then, and you, very good point. I mean, you, you have to think. I mean, this um, actually, th this is just representative of a generic situation. I'm, um, in general, you have to think. And one, for example, one thing you could also is like, why, why not go in this way? Yeah. I mean, why go in this horseshoe-like uh, manner? And um, I forgot the argument, but this one. Uh, but um, very good. Yeah. But in, uh, what, what, what I think is universal is that first of all, for a band insulator where things are in a way, in a, in a, in a manner periodic, um, you, 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 go, um, you, you have typically this structure, and, um, but, but there, there can be others where it looks different, but what will always be the situation is that you have phase transition lines terminating at this uh, edge point. Huh? 
No, that, that is up, up for, that, that you can negotiate. I mean, that is, I, I just want to say there is some control parameter and there is another one which is disorder strength and that defines a plane of lines. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, the, uh, great, I come to that. For that we have to be a little more quantitative. Right now this is just a working assumption. The working assumption is, ah, um, I have formulated a working assumption. Um, it, uh, only one half of it. Um, here, um, this is, um, these, are, uh, these are phases, yeah, which we have on the left. So thermodynamic phases, this is um, length to infinity limit and um, the conclusion is that you have these Anderson insulators and you can stick to them an integer label. These are really, I mean, the big um, lobe here, the big dome, is an n equals one Anderson insulator. Yeah? And um, uh, now earlier we had this two-parameter scaling diagram um, exemplified for the quantum hall that is now 90 degrees rotated. Um, and here uh, we ex describe the flow to this terminal phase. Yeah? And um, then, I mean, the, the uh, expectation is that you need two scaling variables, namely g and the average value of the index, and for a finite size system, you start some, somewhere here, like at 1.6 and g something, and in order to be consistent with this terminal, I mean, thermodynamic limit curve, you better flow to g equals zero, um, insulating behavior, and an integer value, because you want to put the sticker. So, um, in a way, uh, that, I mean, um, this guy here, looks like it in partly because it wants to be consistent with that. But then there are the critical surface in the middle uh, where you really don't know what happens and the, by, by symmetry reasoning, the index is half integer valued. And um, now you can ask indeed if there are, are there other important players in the game and I don't know a first hand qualitative, I mean, but um, I can give you some quantitative evidence. Later. But it's, anyway, it's, uh, yeah, and, and that uh, actually I brought it up here briefly. Um, the question you can, oh no, let's not click all this again. Um, the question you want to ask is, is whether there is a critical theory for that. Yeah. Hmm? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, there, there is a great deal of discussion uh, whether uh, which of the, I mean, whether these guys are always measurable or not. This, um, there is a famous paper by Joel Moore and a few others who discussed just this point. I mean, for other insulators, you have the situation where, yes, there is an observable couple to it. It can be totally obscure, some gravitational stuff or whatever. But as a matter of principle, there is one, or there isn't. In either case, I will argue you have two scaling variables. Um, namely, the av uh, even if you can't measure it, the average topological index is a scaling variable in, in, in the um, relevant theory. And, and w wait me out a little. I mean, I will, I will argue to that effect. Only that um, I think the, the, the uh, rule of thumb is that if there is a mm, measurable observable coupled to the index, like in the integer quantum hall and a few more, you have an, um, exceptional high degree of robustness, say, with regard to interactions and, and, and stuff like that, which you may not have in other cases. So in other cases, the theory can easily go bust if you add interactions. In, so that would be my, my, my yeah, tentative answer. But um, it's again, it's an excellent point. So um, let, let's go a little further and describe this, what I believe is a critical theory, and then we can um, discuss this a little more, perhaps. Um, yeah, so critical theory, I mean, let's first formulate a wish list of criteria based on what we had before, such a um, theoretical description should be able to uh, achieve. Um, While well, we have been there, uh, indices must be describable without reference to momentum space. Working assumption is we need two scaling variables. One is the transport coefficient, the other one is the index averaged. These will assume some whatever non-universal values on a bare level, finite system size level, but then they must flow. And we expect generic flow to insulating behavior and integer um, value of the index. In which case, actually, in this terminal point, you then have well-established edge transport, not before. 
And um, there will be critical interludes where you have n plus one half for the index and something for the um, transport coefficient, which we need to discuss. But it will exhibit this value will reflect delocalization to some degree. Edge state formation must be a consequence of, of all this. Um, there must be um, a twin phenomenon related to this flow. Right? If you have, if you have some disorder, finite, size simple, finite conductance, you're inter intermediate, the edges can always scatter to each other but via the bulk, but eventually they stop doing that once you're fully localized in the bulk. And we expect, hopefully, a similar architecture for all symmetry classes, at least in low dimensions where Anderson localization is strong, one and two. Yeah. So, um, and in concrete terms, this means that, um, uh, well, I mean, here, here there are, again, our insulators, and if we focus on one and two, we have ten topological insulators, five in each dimension, and they should be all described in a similar way by such a construction. Um, now, uh, the situation is, <clears throat> there has been already, I mean, has, has been substantial work in two dimensions, but two dimensions is very complicated. I mean, in, in many cases, we don't, even qu ordinary quantum hall is complicated, and um, it's all in a way consistent with what I have said before, but we don't have quantitative theories. What I would like to focus on now is the case of one dimension, quantum wires, and quantum wires does not mean single chains, but really, I mean, quasi-one-dimensional multi-channel wires in general with this order. And there we are in the uh, lucky situation that um, this uh, theory, including in the presence of disorder, can be made 100% quantitative and analytically. You, you don't need numerics to describe it. You can work it all in, uh, you can construct these uh, flows um, in quantitative ways. And um, let me describe this now on a case study, namely the disordered A3 chain. Yeah? Now we consider disorder in the SSH chain and um, aim to construct a theory. And the first step is, well, we have been there. We need to um, it proceed from a momentum space characterization of a winding number. You have it up there. The Q was this off-diagonal block in the Hamiltonian, yeah, winding number. Making reference to momentum space, we, we have to get rid of momentum space to describe the same index. And how do we do that? I just give you the idea. I mean, that's um, uh, enough. Um, now, we want to work in real space, but we, have to, uh, we need some extra handles to probe something. Yeah? And um, the instinctive response of most theorists will be, let's close the system to a ring. And by ring, I mean now uh, uh, some kind of multi-channel SSH. I mean, there, you see this crisscrossing, so there, there's lots of quantum channels, we have a ring. And then um, a ring as such is not useful, but it becomes useful if we can send something through it, some kind of flux. So we may cook up a flux, and um, this um, flux is now, <laughs> oh, that's a, no, really embarrassing, that's a theorist flux. Namely, it's some kind of fictitious magnetic field which acts differently on circle and cross sites um, in sign. So some, and actually it's, it's uh, one of these axial fields Adolfo is in the process of discussing. So it's, yeah, not experimentally, not, not really, but as a theorist I can do that. And then I ask myself the question, and that, this, this question is asked in varying ways for all insulators. You always ask this question. Let, you cook up a flux which somehow resonates with the symmetry of the system you're in, interested in. You have to invest some creative work, but it exists. And then you ask how does the quantum ground state, the uh, energy, change? It's uh, similar to a Laughlin flux argument, if you have, or Laughlin gauge, if you have heard that term before. You ask how does the um, uh, ground state change as you send a single flux quantum of this guy. And th there's no momentum space involved in that, yeah? And um, we then, <coughs> the, the ground set must be periodic because a single flux quantum doesn't do anything. But um, if you now um, uh, probe it via taking the logarithm of a green function, this, this is a bit more technical, but you have the single particle green function of the system, this is single particle physics in response to this flux. You take its log, and the log is a multi-valued function, so it can this change by 2 pi. And if it changes by 2 pi, you are topological. And if it doesn't change, you are not. And this may sound a bit counterintuitive here. Um, let me give you the technical uh, reason, and uh, maybe later I can give you a physical reason on a different example. Technically, <coughs> the situation is this. If you take this animal down there and you substitute green function, what it is, 1 over e minus h, and work a little, you are in the clean case, you immediately get back to, really immediately, it's two lines, you get back to the formula on top, right? So this formula down here, it collapses in the clean case to that one, and then, uh, well, it's topology. 
if you now add some disorder, um, this formula doesn't, doesn't care. At the same time, it doesn't make reference to momentum space. There is no K used here. Yeah? So this is the general, it, it's a trace formula, trace is spaces invariant. Got the idea? That is so, sort of this game you play for all insulators. And um, that is, uh, from this constructs down there, you can extract both conductance and the index, and the index becomes averaged if we perform an average of this beast. And what we love uh, about it, being theorists, I mean, who have worked in disorder, is the um, G here, G for green function, because we, we have a huge machinery, theoretically, to, to compute green functions in the presence of disorder. Yeah? So what, what we do now is we run an attack on this formula down, down there. And that um, uh, we can do by, uh, and in this case, arguably should do by field theoretical methods. Um, the, the term nonlinear sigma model popped up in uh, the talk by um, Jens. Let, let me ju just t tell you what it means in the present context. On, on, based on a stupid analogy. So we have here some microscopic system and um, think of another microscopic system, an Ising model. In either case, we expect critical phenomena, quantum critical phenomena. Now in the Ising model, we know there is some low energy theory which describes the essence of criticality, and phi to the four, yeah? We, textbook, phi to the four. In the disordered case, for this latter system, there exists a, similar of, a theory of similar flavor, similar status, a long-range effective theory which describes structures on large length scales larger than the scattering mean free path in the system. And the name for it is nonlinear Sika model. That's all you have to know. Yeah? It's, it's similar in status to phi to the four. And um, uh, very briefly, I will not be in any way, I will not derive this and not be technical. I just want to motivate it. So this is how such a nonlinear Sigma model looks. This is the Sigma model for the disordered SSH chain. Structurally, it's like the phi to the four, it's a path integral. In phi to the four, you integrate over scalar variable in as many dimensions as you have. Here you integrate over variable which isn't called phi but t, and it's, it's really similar. It's, it's not a phase, it's, it's a little matrix. It's a two by two matrix. Yeah? It's a matrix value field you are dealing with. And then you have an action, um, action and it's written down there, and um, the action looks um, pretty simple, right? It looks like a path integral, and that's in fact a very productive way of thinking of it. It's a path integral of a quantum particle with a kinetic energy term here, and um, a first derivative term um, here, such a, in a Feynman path integral, a first derivative term, what would it be? What does it typically describe? If you remember Feynman path integral, you have first derivative, like a velocity, single velocity operator. What does it talk to, usually? No? Yeah, maybe, harshly, quite last question. Vector potential. So typically, uh, if you have a you have a vector potential around in a, in a Feynman path, in a free quantum particle, but now you add a vector potential, in, in, on top of the v square term, you catch a v dot a term, right? So that term here is of similar nature, and I, I want to make you sensitive to it, to this analogy. It's very fruitful, um, because this term, like a path integral uh, vector potential in a, in a one-dimensional path integral, is topological. This is a topological term. Um, and uh, this is like a kinetic term, and all, in, all over we have two variables, right? Two coupling constants, and these respectively represent, this will be um, the bookkeeping variable for the conductance, because physically this describes diffusion in a metal, like this is like a diffusion term. Yeah. And that one here is topological, and that's our topological index. And if you construct this path integral for a microscopic system, these guys just pop out as some, from some microscopic calculations, some numbers on the bare level. Yeah? So that's the theory we have to um, uh, solve. Now it looks totally simple, but um, uh, there is one catch, these are really matrices, and that's why this is not just a Gaussian integral. And um, you have to work a little to, um, to solve this, but um, it can be solved, and I, uh, I want to, I, I, I will give you the solution, but I, I also want to tell you in, in, intuitively what, what's going on here, because the thing with this here is that this theory here describes in generically localization for generic values of this, but um, if this here is tuned to a half integer value, it actually gives you delocalization. And uh, without going through these technical details, you can understand um, wh why this is so. Um, this is, I mean, this is optional now, yeah? I mean, I, just for theory aficionados, um, I tell you how, how, how you get this delocalization. And then all others can wake up when I discuss the results or decide to stay asleep. 
Um, so, uh, um, the thing is, um, these matrices are two by two matrices, and um, uh, they, they have in, in the lower right hand block they have a phase setting, and this is again in detail. All I want to say is the essential physics of this path integral is really that of a scalar variable. This is theta is now a scalar angle with just two derivatives, and this is literally a path integral of a quantum particle on a ring. That's what it describes. I mean, we have just mapped it by some mapping the problem one to another, as we often do in theory. Now we have mapped it to a quantum particle on a ring. Now, let's remember what we know from the quantum mechanics of a particle on a ring. Um, it has a spectrum, and this spectrum is just parabolic, right? It means it's second-order derivative term, and, and generically, you have a gap in the spectrum. But suppose now you have some flux. We have a flux, yeah, um, this um, chi thing, um, or some vector potential in the ring, and every once in a while, we hit a point where we have half integer flux quantum, half integer again, yeah? And then you see a spectral gap closes in the spectrum of a particle on a ring. Now suppose you ask for temporal correlations, you are in quantum mechanics lecture course, you are supposed to work out time correlation function of a particle on a ring. Generically, you, you have a gap in the spectrum and correlations will decay quickly, especially if you are in imaginary time as we are here. But if a gap closes, then you have long time correlations. Yeah? Now here, in this analogy, time is length. So the statement is that whenever you are in this half integer situation, you get long time correlations in length, and this is nothing other than delocalization. If you have a wire, it gets longer and longer, and you have algebraic correlations, as opposed to exponential ones, delocalization. So that's how to understand in, in, in semi-qualitative terms how such a field theory, in, the, in, in response or independence to this topological term, to the coupling of the topological term can be delocalized or not. And um, now, um, um, yeah, one can, um, but need not here, discuss this all a little further. Now, this path integral, beyond what I told so far, um, can be solved quantitatively. I mean, in full glory, you, you, you just um, do it, and you do it as you would do in maybe quantum mechanics. You map it to a corresponding Schrodinger equation, and then you work through the formulas. And there is more from it, and you get to this answer. So this is now, the, building on, on the qualitative uh, stuff I said so far, um, the, the actual dependence of conductance and chi, the averaged index, um, as a function of system size, and um, the local, bare localization length in the system, um, represented in formulas. And that doesn't mean much, but um, if you, pl you can plot it. So this is now these guys plotted. Um, again, I mean, you start from for some finite size L, you start with some value of the conductance, some value of chi, and then you just plot these formulas, and you see that this is what goes, happens if you go to L to infinity. So the conductance goes down to zero exponentially fast, and um, your chi uh, approaches um, either zero or one or two, depending on the starting value. And there is a critical surface uh, in the middle where the conductance decays only, not exponentially, but algebraically. It still decays, but very slowly, one over square root of L. And one over square root of L for the average conductance tells you that there is a delocalized state sitting there. I mean, that's um, in uh, Jens' talk, he, he, he was focusing on a given realization, and he told us that every once in a while you have a conducting quantum channel when you hit a phase transition point. In the average conductance, averaged over realization, this amounts to a conductance um, uh, scaling like one over square root of L, sub-omic, yeah? I mean, slower than omic, so there's delocalization sitting there. And that's um, now um, a worked out example of this um, phase diagram, I'm, I'm, or this phase flow, I, I'm introduced previously on qualitative grounds, um, of this guy for this particular case, the disordered SSH uh, chain. Um, let me give you one, uh, there's here's a, a real life uh, a numerical simulation, which sort of, um, well, you, you want to build some trust, right? Um, so what we see here is um, for a lattice, a lattice SSH model, two things. Uh, the boxes are numerically transfer matrix simulations um, where you put a box whenever you have a, a delocalization configuration. And the red lines are for the same microscopic data uh, is the prediction of the critical surfaces uh, from the field theory construction. And um, you see that there's really good agreement 
And um, there is no uh, fitting parameter here. So this is, I mean, I guess it really works. Um, that is for a special case where in the clean case we had all these bands collapse to a single point, but who cares? I mean, that's a detail. Yeah. So um, upshot, I mean, we have now introduced um, the uh, qualitative um, the qualitative predictions for, for the interplay of disorder and uh, topology it came to this kind of a scaling prediction and that is confirmed um, by um, a microscopic calculation here based on quantum field theory. Now, um, the, the question whether there is um, something else in the game, um, it, it's like a, a fight to the four type argument again. Um, in this theory, uh, you, c you cannot add uh, another operator which is anywhere relevant in low dimensions. You can add higher derivative operators if you want, but um, in the long time limit they are all irrelevant if you want in an RG sense. So it's like in a phi to the four context where you neglect higher derivatives and keep those that are um, uh, RG relevant. In the, so that's the technical argument. Okay. Um, now, very quickly, just I don't want to torture you with more wires, but very quickly, uh, a few, few comments on how, how this will develop in the, in the class D quantum wire. That's the Majorana wire. That is that two insulator. And I just want to flash a few things that change compared to um, uh, the previous um, line of reasoning. Um, so now we have a uh, Hamiltonian, which in the Majorana basis is anti-symmetric. Um, and again, you can ask yourself um, how to uh, construct the invariant without momentum space. And this argument is nice. Um, and I actually, I, I don't know who introduced it first. Maybe somebody, I just don't know. I don't know where I know it from. Uh, but um, I know it from somewhere and not my own uh, consideration. But anyway, so invariant of a topological class C2 quantum wire, no momentum space allowed, yeah? Um, what you're supposed to do in this case, I mean, here's first the, the momentum space prescription. You, again, you take a look at the green function of your wire. And everything green function and Hamiltonian depend on momentum. Momentum goes from 0 to 2 pi. And then comes the prescription, take your green function um, at momentum pi and compare to the uh, uh, computed Fafian. Fafian are anti-symmetric matrix, square root of determinant, essentially. Yeah? And uh, compared to that at, with, um, at 0, and you get two numbers, and these numbers are real, and you can ask yourself, what is the sign? And if the sign is positive, um, it's non-topological, and it's negative, it's topological. It works, but it's not very intuitive, right? Um, so let me give you now the real space argument. The real space argument I really love. Um, so we take a class D uh, quantum wire, um, put it um, on a lattice maybe for convenience, one of these Kitaev-like models. And um, the Hamiltonian is anti-symmetric, which means that its matrix elements are real. Hmm? I mean, it's Hamiltonian's I times, but we can think of them as real. And um, now we play the following game. We, we compute the green function of this and can compute its Fafian. And um, uh, the next step is we apply again a flux. A kind of a fictitious flux, but this is now an exceptional situation. We cannot apply some a flux would usually lead to complex matrix elements, right? Flux fluxes do that. So we can only put a flux no flux or a flux minus one. That's the only real flux. I mean, the, the one that leads to real matrix elements. Now, if we if so, let's do the following: we compute the Fafian of G zero compared to the Fafian where we have sent a minus one flux through the system. Now, what does it mean, minus one flux through the system? We can uh, perform a gauge transformation where this minus one sits just is, is zero everywhere by a gauge, except for one side. I mean, in, at one side, we change the sign of the hopping. The hoppings are real, so some values, but if in the presence of, of, of this flux, one of these signs along such a great circle, you just flip their sign. So the prediction is, compare the original um, um, Fafian of the green function to the one where on, you did this surgery on one side. Yeah? And um, this gives us something if the system is topological and the reason for that is intuitive. And we can understand it as follows. So, um, 
suppose we have, in the absence of this manipulation, we have managed to compute the green function, including in the presence of disorder, um, and got a number. Yeah? And now um, we take our single side, it's there on the left, and we want to change its sign, but we do this um, in a way adiabatically. I mean, we, 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 we ask what happens if we do it slowly. We diminish first the value of this coupling and diminish it further, and eventually we want to change the sign, so we go on, but notice that if we do this in this space of real variables, we have to come, we have to sever the system at some point. There is no other way, right? You go from one to minus one, you have to go by zero, if everything is real. So we cut the system. Now, if the system is cut, um, there will be Majorana end state, if it is topological. Right? It's now an open system, so there must be Majorana end states. Majorana end states are zero modes. You have two of them. That leads to a zero of second degree in the green function, two zeros, and of first degree in the square root of the green function, which is a Pfaffian. So the prediction is that if there are Majoranas, and only then, the, um, the, the, the guy must have a first order zero crossing in the process. So no matter what, um, the Pfaffian in the, in the presence of pi will, will have had picked up a sign change. And that's the origin of this, um, uh, this, this invariant. Did you get this? I, I, find, I like this argument because really it's, um, it, it's very general. It doesn't, it doesn't care about disorder or whatever. Um, it just works. So that is now in this D, D context. This is, we have now sort of we arrive at a Z2 gauge theory instead of a quantum particle on a ring in a continuous flux. And then we again play the same game. I mean, we do key field theory and um, do whatever we are supposed to do. And in the end of the day, um, eventually, after some steps, come back no, to, where are you? Ah, right, um, no, 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 don't worry. Uh, phase diagram, yeah. So that's um, now from, from this um, theory, and which is technically very different, but still can be solved um, analytically, which is kind of strange, because these theories are, are usually, I mean, from my own experience, are complicated. But in these topological cases, you can just solve them, which means something is going on, um, which, which makes them solvable, and I don't know what it is. M maybe there's some smart, smart reason for that. So that is, um, I'm done almost. Uh, this is uh, what in, in happens in 1D. Um, in 2D, um, similar stories going on, uh, historically partly much older. I mean, this two-parameter scaling, as I mentioned, was introduced in the early 80s. And shortly after, by Pruskin, um, formulated in an effective theory of very similar flavor, the famous Pruskin theory, for the integer quantum Hall effect. It's again, it's a two-parameter, they are all two-parameter um, topological theories, and um, they all pretty much describe the same um, scaling flow. Uh, so that, that is, is well established. And um, the next... Um, logical step would be to discuss what, what you can actually do. I mean, this has been thermodynamics in a way so far, yeah? but um, uh, what happens as you go to this limit, as you kill the bulk, I mean, localization, right? It, be, it comes that the, the edge comes alive. I mean, these are twin, twin phenomena. And um, so in the thermodynamic limit, you, you, in all these cases, you have a, you have a lively edge, edge theory, which describes edge transport building on a disordered system. And um, you can then <coughs> discuss what this means for quantum transport and for Majorana states and God knows what. Um, another um, extension from here is to go in the direction of gapless matter. I mean, there is a similar framework you can do for the Valsemi metal, which is very interesting, I think. But my time is up. So I guess I stop here. Thank you. Right. Um, what happens, um, say, in, in the quantum hall, I mean, just to mention one example, is th this has been a bulk theory. I mean, technically, in the quantum hall effect, that's a theory with a theta term. And when, when you have a topological bulk theory with a certain class of topological terms, say theta, you uh, generically have topological theories sitting at the boundaries. I mean, it, it, this is just a formal statement. In the case of the quantum hall, it's a Vesomino theory, Vesomino Witten. And this Vesomino Witten is a. Is a um, theory which um, describes carrel transport, 
and is massively protected by the presence of a vasomenoderm. So you can you can do whatever you want to it. You will either you kill it as a whole, you blow it up by interactions or temperature, um, but otherwise it survives. And um, that, in fact, there is one avenue to classifying topological insulators, which has been put forward by Ryu and Ludwig and so on, uh, which just look at the possible allowed topological terms in nonlinear SIGA models, and based on that, you can say what kind of topology can go on in the bulk. So there is always a, there is a shadow shadow construction in all these. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. No. In the, in the, in the, do you mean key type chain class D? I mean, most people call it key type chain this BD1 chain where you have time reversal. Okay, that's 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 in the uh, with time reversal symmetry breaking, right? With a magnetic field. Yeah. Yeah, but key type chain, most people uh, or many. Uh, uh, think of is, is, is this wire without magnetic field in the absence of time reversal? But I know what you mean. I mean, yes, and they look similar, and they are similar, and for all practical purposes, they are the same. Mm, yeah, well, uh, they are quantitative details. I mean, how these? Uh, first of all, in the in the in the in this Majorana, this is that too. So you have only the indices minus one and one, if you want, and it doesn't periodically extend. Yeah, in the class D, you have a you have just a, a pattern. Beyond that, um, there are minor details in what, is what ex exponential profile, I mean, details in the exponential flows, but nothing worth remembering. Yeah. What is known about the Ah, very good. In the one, uh, remember, um, um, huh? StatMac, uh, Ising model? In, in the 1D case, we do a transfer matrix calculation, right? So we just block spin, and that, that's what we did here. And I'm mentioning it because uh, in this block spin construction, you get the analytic flow with all bells and whistles. So the, my answer would be it's these two formulas, and from them you can read of whatever exponent you want quantitatively. In 2D, so in 1D it's just solved. In, in 2D, it's, it's a lot more tricky. I mean, we have one quantum hole system, the class C, it's some superconductor um, quantum hole for which the critical theory is known. It's in, in a percolation class, and we just know what's going on. For the integer quantum hole, it has become a sport. I mean, uh, may, I mean, maybe several of you know, but I mean, mm, there are numerical values on the indices, whether it's 2.35 or 2.36 for the localization exponent and multifractal. And every once in a while, a new candidate critical theory pops up. So it's not known. And in, in, in others, say, um, the, the, the quantum insulator, uh, quantum hole, um, this really quantum hole insulator, I mean the um, quantum spin hole, and the class D two-dimensional, there is really qualitative parts of the physics which are not really very well under control. But, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, the answer here would be um, there were Adolfo's talk, yeah? Remember yesterday he had this vile semi-metal and he has this B. I mean, this B will become, a, maybe it is already, will become an axial electromagnetic field. It's an axial field, it's gamma 5. So this gamma 5 uh, can be, um, what it describes in electromagnetic language is differences between electromagnetic. So here in the SSH, we can also introduce left movers and right movers. It's chiral. So this is a flux which couples differently to the left and right movers, and it's totally artificial. For my, um, maybe some cold atom guys can come up with something, but I, I cannot imagine. <laughs> mm.